Good. Good to have you guys here. Welcome to, to Pulse. It's, it's a treat to be uh, here. I've loved every year that I've gotten to either attend or speak or be a part of Pulse. Just great. It's so fun to have this uh, room of people together and talk about things that matter to us in a, in a way that don't necessarily matter to everyone in our church communities or in our communities at large. And so it's just great. It's a little subculture here. We get to just encourage each other. So uh, what I'd like to do today, we're going to talk about uh, prophecy and poetry and uh, the art of, of perception. And uh, what I'd like to do is I uh, show you a picture of a guy named Edgar Mueller. Edgar Mueller, uh, is, uh, he's a German a street artist, uh, and he doesn't do graffiti, like he actually paints streets. And uh, so what he does, he actually like, gets permits, appeals to the city, gets a permit, and this kind of thing. And how many have heard of Edgar Mueller before or seen his work? Oh, oh, quite a number of you. Yeah, there you go. So this guy's so incredible. Um, he has kind of pioneered this unique form of large-scale urban art in uh, cities all around uh, Europe. And uh, how he starts the process, he gets a permit... And he, he goes to a large place like here, like a boardwalk or like a city square. And uh, he gets a little, see in the, in the next slide here, up in the upper left, he gets a little, uh, he has a little three, like a fisheye glass thing that he sets up. And he uses that to map out the perimeter of, of the space. And so like in the upper right, he starts setting out these long, long lines of tape to get the dimensions of what he's doing, and then he, he, essentially what he's doing is he's creating, if you stand in one spot, he's creating what will become a 3D visual experience, right, there in that large public, but you have to stand in that spot where the glass is standing, right there, and so the next slides, uh, it, this takes him like all the parts of a day, and so he begins, he has lots of people that he works with and so on, and then he of course does the final, the final work, so this is called, this one's just called the crevasse. <laughs> the crevasse, and so the, the end result of this board, this whole boardwalk looks like, uh, looks like this. Isn't that unbelievable? It's unbelievable. Now, what's interesting, you can go, he has a whole website and everything, it's, it's interesting to look at. You can go look at pictures that are taken like from the side, and then immediately the illusion's over. And you say, oh yeah, it just looks like a sidewalk with funny patterns of blue paint. But it, you, the moment you stand in that one spot where that where that eyeglass was, boom, you are about to fall into, into the crevasse. I'll show you a couple more just because they're mind-blowing. They're mind so this is, uh, I think also along a boardwalk, I can't really tell, but it looks like you're going to die in two seconds. <laughs> you're, right? you're like hovering. It's so about to, uh, to fall in. This next one's my personal favorite. Look at that. Look at that. This is unbelievable, right? You're going to, you are going to die in this one, right? And it's like the heat, I don't know how he accomplished, he accomplished that. But there you go, Edgar, Edgar he's, a, he's an eccentric guy. And he, you can look for him around YouTube and see interviews and stuff like that. And uh, I was just kind of reading about him, it's super interesting. And uh, I came across a couple lines that he said during one of, one of his interviews. And he was asking, like, what's part of the core inspiration for doing this kind of thing in these large public spaces? There's not many people on the planet who are doing this kind of thing. And this is what he, he said. He said, in my paintings, I'm trying to question our perception of daily life by changing the appearance of public spaces. By playing with positives and negatives, i.e. that feeling of, I'm about to die, right? So playing positives and negatives, it forces people to think twice about everything they see. And, and again, if you read other interviews with him, his, his core fascination is with human perception, how we perceive the spaces that we dwell and live and work and walk in every single day. So it was a boardwalk. Now it's like a death-defying, treacherous pass that you have to get through, right? And the space hasn't changed. What's, your perception of the space has changed because of the paint that he's laid down on the ground. He's, in, Edgar Mueller, his whole thing is about perception. And so he's, he's convinced that if we were simply able to, to become awake to reality, the simple realities of our everyday spaces, the people, the things that are there, you know, he says this in other, other interviews, you know, it's... It's very improbable that any of us should be here right now, existing, I mean. You know what I mean? It's very improbable that, like, 
that any of this is here and that we're sitting here having an arts conference, human beings, we're conscious, you know what I mean? It's very improbable that any of us should be here. It, it should actually blow our minds every day that our eyes wake up, you know, and we're ready. But no, we're bored with life and we want to go, you know, we want to go watch, you know, whatever, reality TV or something like that. And so, and so his whole thing is trying to, trying to shake people awake by playing with these extreme positive negative images that you're like, whoa, and to, to force you awake like this was the boardwalk I normally like tune out to as I walk to work or back to work every day, but now it's this new amazing space. And he, so that's, this is whole deal. It's helping people see what they do not currently see. And the reason that people don't currently see it isn't because it's not there, he's just convinced that we're blind to these amazing realities. So he paints these huge apocalyptic scenes on the streets to wake people up to how crazy life is and how strange the world, the world actually is. And as I've reflected on this and just kind of followed his art over the last couple of years, I, it, it struck me that what his core motivation is right there, it's, it's actually very similar, I think, to the artistic impulse in general, which is namely to, to create some kind of creative work, whatever form it is, written, visual, creating a, a, a moment, like Nancy Beach said, beauty, mo uh, beauty stories are moments. And people encounter those, those forms of art, and essentially, it's, it's like what Edgar Mueller is trying to do. It's, it alters your perception. Here's a story about a way I've never thought to process life or, or a new, fresh angle. It's a moment that exposes something inside of me. It's beauty that overwhelms me. And all of a sudden, my vision, my perception has changed. I look at my own life in a brand, brand new light. I have a, I have a new angle to see my, my work or my coworkers or my family circumstances or so on. That's part of what creative uh, artistic work does. It's aimed at altering our, our perception. That's what, that's what Edgar Mueller does. That's what art does. And it seems to me that's, that's part of what we, we all do. A huge part of us here are a part of crafting um, m moments in our gatherings as followers of Jesus. It's where, whether it's encountering beauty, stories, or, or moments, like, like uh, Nancy Beach said, where people encounter, encounter the presence of Christ in a way that alters their perception of themselves, of their relationships. And so, so many of you, you function on a team of some kind, creating that kind of space. Some of you are career artists that are here. Some of you are, you're wishing you could be career artists and like you're doing a thing that will like keep you paying the bills in the meantime until you can do this, turn your hobby into your job, whatever. We're all over the map here, but this is a room full of creatives and our goal or our aim is essentially to do what Edgar Mueller is doing, to help people discover something. And of course, if this conference had nothing to do with Jesus, I don't know what would be helping people discover, like Micah was saying, right? Because the pit goes pretty deep inside each one of us. But, but if we're trying to help people uncover the presence and the reality of Christ that's right in front of them, that they don't yet have eyes to see or that they need to see in a fresh way again, it seems to me we have a lot to learn from people like Edgar Mueller, trying to shake, shake people awake. And so if that's you, uh, then you and Edgar Mueller uh, stand in a long line an honorable tradition uh, in Jewish and Christian history of people who are trying to help others see what they don't currently see and to alter their perception of themselves and, and of, the, of the world. And that long tradition in Israel was, uh, was a group of people called the B'nai Nevi'im, the sons of the prophets. And here's an interesting fact that will be great for you to pull out at parties very soon, very soon, is that uh, the prophets, I, started, I say the word prophet, and I think most of us Westerners, we tend to think of uh, pr prediction. Are you guys with me here? Prediction of future events. That's what I think the English word prophecy mostly refers to for, for most of us. That, that's not the core uh, value or definition or expression of prophecy in the Bible. Sometimes prophecy may involve prediction, but always to serve a much greater purpose. And that purpose is illuminated by actually what prophets used to be called before they were called prophets in ancient Israel. There's a, there's a story, this is the part that will be useful at parties, a little random fact. So there's a, a little story in the book of 1 Samuel about this guy named Saul, maybe you've heard of him. And uh, he, he was wandering around the wilderness looking for his dad's lost donkeys. 
any story that begins with your dad's lost donkeys is going to be interesting. You know what I'm saying? So your dad's lost donkeys. So he's got a couple of people and he's cruising around the wilderness looking for his dad's lost donkeys. He has no clue where they are. And so he sees this village here and he hears that there's a, there's a prophet in the village. And he's like, well, maybe this guy can help me find my dad's lost donkeys. And so he goes to them and then the story pauses. And the narrator, the storyteller, just pauses the story and just speaks to you directly, the reader. And this is what the storyteller says. It's so interesting. He says, now, dear reader, formerly in Israel, if someone went to go inquire of God, they would say, come, let us go to the the seer. Because what we call prophets here today, back in the old days of Israel, they called them seers. Seers. They were not always called prophets. They're called seers. This is their oldest name in the Israelite tradition, seers. So prophets by name are people who see differently than others see. That's why you go to them. You want to know what your friends see, just ask them. You You want to know what your culture sees, like go watch reality TV or something like that, right? So you, you you want to get the most unique perspective. You want to get a divine perception On your culture or your life, you go to the seer. The seer sees differently than others see. Say that 10 times fast. (laughs) The seer, they see differently. They perceive differently than others. That's their role. And specifically, as we're going to see with one of of Israel's most prominent seers or prophets, uh, Isaiah, son of Amos, it was an encounter with a living God that gave him that altered perception. These are figures through one way or another, they had been marked and undergone some kind of powerful, we would even call it mystical experience with the being and the presence and the reality of, of God. And it fundamentally altered their perception. And they became marked as people. You go to that person if you want to get God's perspective. That's the, that's the core attribute of prophecy. God's perspective on human events and, and human history. That's prophecy. And so these figures played a hugely important role in the story of Israel. And and here's what's even more interesting. You go to a seer if you want to get an alternate vision of reality, an altered perception. And when these figures in Israel, when they spoke and when they wrote and composed books, what's the medium of speech that the seers and prophets of Israel use? Open your Bibles and what kind of speech is one third of your Bible? What did they write in? Okay, all right, good. We're learning something today. All right, it's good. So there's poetry. Po- did you know this? I mean, you opened any of the books of the 15 prophets in your Bible, except the book of Jonah. It has a poem in chapter 2. But it's almost entirely poetry. When these figures had this altered perception of reality and then tried to put that into words, the most fitting medium possible, in their view, was poetry. Prophetic Poetry. So it seems to me that, uh, that we, as a group of people and who we are and what we're doing here, have some things to learn from the prophetic poetry that's, that's in the Bible. Not just the content and message, but how these seers went about doing what they did. Because their goal is much the same as Edgar, Edgar Mueller's goal, is much the same as, as our calling. To help people see what they do not currently see. To help shape their, their perception. Uh, Robert Alter, he is uh, one of the most prominent Jewish scholars uh, on Hebrew poetry. He wrote the book on Hebrew poetry, and he, he puts it this way. This is really fascinating. He says, the prophetic poetry of the Bible is not just a set of techniques for saying impressively what could be said otherwise. Isaiah could have just said, you all are sinners and screwed up. Right? But instead he says, you are, oh, sons of Israel. You know? <laughs> so he has this whole line at the beginning of like, you know, children know where their parents live. And you know, like a donkey knows where its master lives. My people, dumber than an ass. You know what I'm saying? Like they do. <laughs> literally, literally, right? So, I mean, that's, that's the first line. That's a way to win friends and influence people. You know what I mean? <laughs> like right out, of, right out of the gate. And he's not just being pretty about it. He's not just saying impressively what he could have said otherwise. No, the poetic form is vital to the calling of a prophetic poet. Poetry is, is the key, that form of speech. He says it's not just a way of saying impressively what could have been said otherwise. Rather, it's a particular way of seeing and imagining the world. It's the prophetic or poetic imagination. 
It's an altered form of seeing. I don't know how many of you read poetry widely. If you read the Bible at any length, a third of it's poetry, you guys. And so you may not know that you're reading poetry or be attuned to that fact or pay attention to its significance, but it's sitting right there in your lap every Sunday, right? right? A third of it's just dense Hebrew poetry. Put into English, but it's, it's poetry. There it is. There it is. It's about altered forms of perception. And these prophets, they were eccentric figures because of this altered vision. I, th uh, I think of them, they were like Obi-Wan. My imaginative universe has been shaped by Star Wars, right? I don't know what yours <laughs> has been. And so, but they're, they're like Obi-Wan, Obi Deserts of Tatooine. These were odd, eccentric figures, all right? Many of them lived out of the desert, John the Baptist, right? Some in caves, just bizarre. They're odd. They're odd because they saw differently. They, people looked out and say, things are fine, peace and security, right? The contemporaries of Jeremiah says, and he says, no, death, pestilence, plague, <laughs> injustice, you know? He saw it, it made him strange, strange. Some of you all are strange, right? <laughs> and you're those people in your church community, right? And so when you come up to the leaders or whatever, and like, oh, this guy again, you know? <laughs> so some of you are those, are those people, right? Because you see differently, you see differently than others around you see. And that, that can be an isolating experience. And it can also create like a strange Messiah complex too and be really unhealthy. And so you got to watch for that, right? But there's also a sense in which those kinds of figures have always been vitally important in the history of God's people. It's, it's people like the prophetic voices and who are most, most typically artists in the history of the church who call God's people to remember a vision of the world and of ourselves and God that the, the church has lost. It's a vitally important role, and it's often played by artists, it's often, and it's played by you. It's you. When we gather God's people together, it's about altering the perception, reminding them of what's really going on. And so what I'd like to do, kind of with this focus on, on prophetic poetry and how it alters our, our vision, I want to focus in just on one, uh, one poem. If you uh, look in your, your folder that you got for the day, there's kind of a handout, there's an outline for the day. On the, I think it's like the second or third page of that is a, a little prophetic poem from Isaiah chapter 30. You guys with me? Did you find it? Okay. So this is like, Bible study hour. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to look at a poem in, in the book of Isaiah that you may or may not have ever even noticed before. But uh, uh, Isaiah, son of Amos, was one of the most brilliant, I think one of the most brilliant literary geniuses that ancient Israel ever saw. And uh, Jeremiah is a great poet. Ezekiel was a straight up weird guy. <laughs> I like to read his book, right? So Hosea was an amazing poet. Isaiah, Isaiah, man, this... Un unbelievable, brilliant, brilliant, poetic, prophetic mind. And so, what, uh, and so we're going we're gonna to read the poem and then I think draw two, pay attention to two features of it that I think could be very useful. They've been useful to me uh, as a voice in my own church community and uh, I hope they're useful to you as we look at these two features of the poem and think about how they could kind of stimulate some fresh ideas or fresh work for, uh, for you all. Uh, so Isaiah, Isaiah ben Amos, Yeshyahu ben Amos is his Hebrew name, Isaiah uh, the son of Amos. And he lived uh, during the reigns of two, uh, of two kings in Israel pr primarily. Uh, one of them was the worst and one of them was one of the best kings uh, Israel ever saw. One was named uh, Ahaz, he was a chump, bad guy. One, another one was a guy named Hezekiah, he was a, a mostly good guy but he had some pretty serious failures. And uh, essentially what happened is during the reigns of these two kings, uh, the, the Israel or Judah is fighting for its life on a, on a stage of empire players. It's just a petty little kingdom. A I don't know why scholars call it this, but it's my favorite name. They call, it, they call Israel during this period a rump kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just like, all the, no, the body's been all cut off and it's just the rump that's left, I'm not sure. So a little rump state, right? And uh, so they're, they're minor players. But both Ahaz and Hezekiah uh, made huge efforts to get into bed with two of the greatest empires of the day, Egypt and uh, Assyria. And so they're importing horses, they're importing chariots, uh, you know, they're, they're getting military protection, they're getting training from these great empires of the day. And of course, in that day, religion and politics are not artificially separated, as they are in our culture, strangely. And so it was a part of getting into bed in alliances with these other kingdoms would have been adopting their gods. 
And there's actually a story in, in the book of Kings about Ahaz going to Assyria and saying, that's a really cool altar to your God. Can we get one of those for the Yahweh temple in Jerusalem? Would love that. And he straight up set up an alternate altar to another God right next to Yahweh's altar in the temple in Jerusalem. People loved it. This is progress. This is, this is the way to, to get the esteem of the nations around us. This is how, this is security. This is defense. This is our future. That's what people saw. It's not what Isaiah saw. He didn't see anything like that at all. He saw differently. And he wrote a poem about it. He wrote many poems about it. Uh, here's one of them, chapter 30. He says, For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. We should have Micah read this. <laughs> so, anyway, so they, say, they say to the seers, see no more visions. They say to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path. Stop confronting us with this Holy One of Israel. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message and relied on oppression and are leaning on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly. In an instant, it will break into pieces like pottery shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces, not a fragment will be found. I'm getting into Micah Borne style here. Not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water from a cistern. This is what sovereign Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, says in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you would have none of it. You said, no, no, we'll flee on horses. Oh, yes, you will flee. You said, we'll ride on swift horses. Oh, yes, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five, you will all flee away until you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop and like a banner on a hill. Isaiah Ben of Amos, you have my number. <laughs> Isaiah, son of Amos, you have my number. Call me if you want more of this, right? So, what? Whoa, whoa. I mean, just the intensity. The intensity. This is not a way to make friends, and it might be a way to influence people. It's not a way to make friends. Isaiah was, a, was an isolated figure in the, in the city of Jerusalem. And there are two features of this poem uh, that have been instructive for me. Uh, I've, uh, over the years, I've been uh, teaching courses on Hebrew poetry and Old Testament poetry at Western Seminary in Portland. And I just, dude, a third of your Bibles is just like a foreign world when you learn to discover the beauty of this, uh, this poetry. There's two features I want us to pay attention to. And if you're looking down, you can, uh, you can see it uh, there and you, you can mark it up or do, do whatever you want to. We'll kind of have it up here on the screens. The first feature, and maybe I just ask it in this question, and just think about the power of this poem that he wrote, this altered perception of what, uh, of what everyone saw. And it's a, it's a feature I would call this uh, amalgamation. Look at the raw materials. What, what's he getting at here? He thinks Israel has compromised its covenant faithfulness to Yahweh, completely unfaithful, and is going the path of injustice and apostasy and sin. Right? That's, that's what he's doing. Right? So he could have said that in just two sentences. <laughs> but instead he, he writes this poem with gravity. And it's loaded with all of these metaphors. Did you see? They're just flying off the page here. Did you catch the metaphors? Right? So what, what, are, what are the raw materials of these images, these poetic images and metaphors in the poem? He's talking about a cracked castle wall. But then he starts talking about pottery, and then he starts talking about fireplaces, but then he starts talking about watering holes, and then he's, you know, he's talking about horses and soldiers and hills and flagpoles. What do all of these things have in common with each other? <laughs> so nothing. <laughs> nothing, right? Seriously, what do all the, or everything, right? Or everything. See, so what, what this, what a poem like this gets us into is it's the mind of what the raw materials are for, for prophetic poetry that tries to alter how, how people see. What are the materials that he's working with? They are all of these are images drawn 
from daily life around Jerusalem 2,700 years ago. <laughs> That's what they are. A castle wall. A castle wall. That he walked by, who knows, haven't had a decade. He walked by it. And he saw the fissures and the cracks, the slow bulge, right? And he reflected on the fact when little Isaiah Jr. dropped his favorite piece of pottery right, on the floor. And he's thinking about that one battle that he saw and seeing the, fl the, ban the, the war banner raised on the distant hill by the lone soldier who made it up, right? He's thinking about these stallions, these Egyptian stallions that he's seen race through Jerusalem. He's just, you know, the raw materials is just his life. You, you can just see from this poem, he's just straight up taking notes on his life. He pays attention. He pays attention to the things that he sees, and he sees something that most of us don't see. We would just be, oh, like castle wall and horses, you know, and, and like, yeah, my son dropped my pot or something like that. It's a bummer. No, but he's, no, no. He sees something else. So Isaiah, right earlier in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 6, Isaiah had this very powerful experience in the temple where he saw this vision of, of, of Yahweh's presence. And uh, he heard a little line of poetry that has echoed in Jewish and Christian worship throughout the, the centuries, right? And what is that little poetic line? Isaiah chapter 6. What is the fiery angelic beings? What are they screaming in Yahweh's presence? They're screaming, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh almighty. What else? The whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth. So, so Isaiah has this very profound experience that, holy cow, like here I am in the temple. I thought this was the hot spot of God's presence, but actually the weightiness of Yahweh's presence floods the whole of creation. And so you can imagine Isaiah walking away from that experience, all of a sudden perceiving his life in a new way, that all of a sudden the castle wall and the Egyptian stallion and Isaiah Jr. breaking the pot, these are actually all have an inner unity now. His life has cohesion. It's the mind of the prophetic poet. And this term amalgamation is the complex multi-syllable word that helped me think of a new one. I don't know. But I got it from T.S. Eliot. You guys know T.S. Eliot? He's one of the most amazing poets of the 20th century. And, and he's actually where I got this idea from. He says it this way. He says, when a poet's mind is perfectly equipped for its work, it's constantly amalgamating disparate experiences. The ordinary man's experience is chaotic irregular and, and fragmentary. He falls in love, he reads Spinoza, and these experiences have nothing to do with each other or with the noise of the typewriter or the smell of cooking. But in the mind of the poet, these are always forming new holes. Do you see this here? Isaiah's mind was attuned to the details of his life, looking for how they illustrate life in, in Yahweh's universe. And all of a sudden, even the most simple things that he normally would have walked by, just like people walk down the sidewalk of, of this bay front or this waterfront that Edgar Mueller shakes up the perception, this is what Isaiah is doing. All of a sudden, that crack in the castle wall has a deep truth to communicate about the brokenness of the human heart. And that flagpole on a hill it becomes this powerful, resonating image about the isolation of being at the end of a long road of compromising stupid decisions that cut you off from other people and from God. It's powerful. Power. It's amalgamation. And I, don't, I have no idea how Isaiah did this other than that he just had a little moleskin, you know, notebook. <laughs> and he's just like, the castle wall? Oh, it's a little bigger today. Mm, you know, and then a week, Saturday morning with tea. And he's just like, what did I see this week? You know, and how can I stick it to him? When I go preach on the corner on Monday, you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, what? This, there you go. There you go. That's actually very practical, isn't it? You can just, the raw material of his, of his poetry, of this altered sense of vision, is taking these normal, seemingly mundane experiences charged by this coherent, unified vision of his life. Everything is charged with meaning. And that becomes a, a source of creative inspiration for him. And it has to be. The, Isaiah's... The book, the poetry in the book of Isaiah, every, the, every page is like this. The metaphors and the images, and they're all from daily life, just spilling off of the page. And so this has just been a helpful lesson and encouragement for me. You know, there are some times where, so for me as, as, a, as a purveyor of the verbal arts, <laughs> namely sermons, right? Or uh, for you, whatever, whatever form of creative expression it is, you know when you get that block. 
and you're thinking like, oh, like where's the new idea? How do you do this? Five hours and the page is still blank, you know? Dang it. And so where does, but you, Isaiah's just, he's looking out his window at the castle wall and looking at the pot that Isaiah Jr. just broke. And there you go. That's, so this is very practical. Do, do, do you have a pattern or a rhythm of some kind for paying attention to the seemingly mundane experiences of your life? Could it be that the prophetic poetry that, that issues out of your own creative expression or the team that you work on is actually sitting right around you in the room? It just happened to you yesterday. If you're paying attention, if you're paying attention to your life, it's like to do another Frederick Beekner quote, listen to your life. <laughs> it will tell you what you're looking to hear. Just listen, listen to it. This is the principle of uh, amalgamation. Uh, as a visual illustration of this, how many of you remember that uh, movie, A Beautiful Mind, Russell Crowe? You remember this movie? Oh, so I was, I was thinking, I don't want ever be able to replay the moment of when you find out that he's, spoiler alert, right? That he's, he's actually crazy and schizophrenic, right? And that the people that you have been coming to know and love as characters in the story aren't actually real. Holy cow, this is a breathtaking moment. And so what, uh, what's happening essentially is a math teacher and he is, he's, he's convinced that he is like the secret cryptographer that the government has hired to crack the code of uh, what's happening in, in the world stage. And so he has this room. He has a secret room where he's putting together all of these disparate pieces of information and newspaper clippings and stuff. Do you guys remember this scene? The room? I'll show you pictures of the room again. And all of these pieces of paper are tied together by strings. And he's like, this thing goes with that thing, goes with this thing, goes with that thing. So here we go. There you go. Now that looks intimidating, and that will definitely like, make your coworkers think you're crazy. So don't do this to your office, right? But, <laughs> but this is the idea, keeping track and paying attention. Do you have a rhythm for keeping, keeping track of the things that are happening in your life? Could it be that your life is the, the raw material of your next project or your next work? This is the principle of amalgamation. It's a feature of, of Isaiah's poetry. There's another feature, and it's what does he do with all of these images now that he's put them together? So look, look at the poem again, and let's go back to the, uh, the third, I think it's the, or the second screen of uh, the Isaiah quote. It's the castle wall. Okay, good, good. So uh, this is, uh, look what he's done with this image. It's a castle wall. You and I would walk by a castle wall. And all of a sudden, this image becomes a way for him not just to illustrate a truth that everybody already knows, the castle wall actually becomes a way of getting into the psychology of, of sin and self-deception. So just think as he's perceiving this, this bulge in the, in the castle wall, it's something, you know, we, we, we're living our lives, we think we're doing fine, it's just one little compromise, it's just one little bad decision, right? And so no one's going to see it, it's just hidden there, but repeat it again, repeat it again, give it time. Those decisions become habits. And all of a sudden, this becomes a habit that's harder to hide. Your spouse might notice, your temper, you're giving in to it, these, these things you're hiding, whatever, whatever it is, and all of a sudden, it becomes harder, harder to hide. The fissures begin to run deep. It's really hard to make any good decisions in that area anymore. And then it's, but it's a slow build, slowly. It's years. It's years that your character is being shaped and distorted by these bad decisions until one day, and you're done, dude. You're done. Your life's in pieces on the floor. And so all of a sudden, this metaphor, how Isaiah couldn't have said it otherwise. He couldn't have just said, sin ruins your life. I would have fallen asleep. <laughs> all, but he uses these images. And so what, uh, what this principle is, is a principle of poetry. Um, Thomas Long talks about it, but it's a principle, if we go forward a few more, um, it's called disruption. Thomas Long puts it, uh, puts it this way. Poetry works to disrupt the customary ways in which we use language. Poetry stretches the ordinary uses of words and places them into unfamiliar relationships with each other, thereby cutting fresh paths across the gro well-worn grooves of, of everyday language. Sin and a crumbling castle wall. Never would have put that together. But the moment he combines and amalgamates these images, whoa, whoa, he's, he's you know, he's got you by the neck. Because <laughs> we're all going like, guilty, guilty, that's me right there. 
right? And, and then the isolating nature of, of sin, the long-term effects of sin on our lives, like alone flagpole. He does this disrupting image. But actually at the core of this poem is, I think, the most disrupting image of all. It's verse 15, uh, which, uh, again, if we can get, to, I think, the third screen back up here, is probably the verse that you've seen cross-stitched on your grandma's wall before, right? It's, the very, it's at the top one here. How, where is Israel's salvation and strength? It's repentance. It's rest. Quietness. This is disrupting. This is this is poetic disruption. What? No, no. We need to build our army. We need to pay tribute to Assyria. We need to get their stallions and get their tanks and chariots and so on. And no, stop, stop. Pray, pray. Go to sleep. Rest. That's your strength. You're like, whoa. He, sho he shocks you with this image. It's disruption. This poetic disruption. That's why, that's why Micah's spoken word is so powerful. He's, he's speaking to experiences we all know, and then he disrupts you with this, this turn of phrase, this precisely chosen word, and it just it shocks you awake. It's prophetic, it's prophetic poetry. A third of your Bible has this power. Do you know this power? Have you experienced it in the, in the pages of the scriptures? What what could we learn about our own tasks as, as creatives by, uh, by taking from uh, prophetic poetry? There's, uh, there's a group to kind of illustrate in visual art this, this, uh, uh, this point here. There's a group of artists in, uh, in Portland uh, last year. Uh, the, the, city, the city of Portland, it's a wonderful place, it's very quirky and strange. Uh, it also has a very, very dark underbelly. There, there are more uh, strip clubs and porn video shops per resident than any city uh, in the United States. And, and it's directly connected to the sex trade in Portland, which is directly connected to just the prolific problem of teen homelessness on the streets of Portland. And so uh, the city started giving away, they wanted to do like an awareness raising uh, campaign. And so there, it was so rad, there were a number, a, a whole collective of Christian artists in Portland got together from a number of different churches. There were some from Door of Hope and uh, they did a poster campaign, essentially. And so they developed a whole series of posters and the city paid for these posters to be put up all throughout the city by a grant that they applied for, so rad. And so some of these posters, they, they embody this principle of, of disruption. Taking common images and putting them together in a way that shocks and makes you pay attention. A teddy bear should never be set next to triple X spelled in lipstick. That should never happen, right? So the American apparel legs, right? that we're so familiar with by being inundated, right, through advertising. And all of a sudden you're disrupted and to say that those legs are connected to a human being made in God's image. This is not for sale. This is disruption. This disruption is taking what's familiar, combining it in ways that shock you into attention. Your sin is like a castle wall. It'll leave you like a lone flag top on a hill if you go down that path. And so how are you going to arm up and, and change your life? By repenting, by resting. It's shocking. It's a disruption. This is the power of, power of prophetic poetry. How are you guys doing? Is this interesting? Amalgamation and, and disruption. There's, uh, there's one line of poetry in the book of Isaiah that uh, I think contains the ultimate uh, combination of these features of amalgamation and and disruption. And it's a line of poetry that is at the heart of our confession as followers of Jesus. It's found in Isaiah chapter 53. He wrote this line, he says, he, the, the, the servant Messiah, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us shalom that's the word there in Hebrew, shalom, well-being and wholeness. We get shalom, the servant gets punishment. And by his wounds, we are healed. How can the wounds of someone else bring healing to me? Exactly, exactly. 
in the universe that most of us live in, that kind of thing doesn't really happen. But maybe we're living in the wrong imaginative universe. Maybe the universe that we're actually living in is a world where we are all crumbling castle walls, where we are all isolated on a hilltop as a result of our stupid decisions. That is, Mike illustrated, we can't, we can't escape. And if all we're here to do is commiserate about being at the bottom of that pit, I'd rather be at the skate park. You'd rather be golfing or whatever else. You know what I mean? Like, that's all we're here to do. But no, we're, we're here to, to proclaim that we live in a different kind of universe where things like this are true. That's a prophetic claim, isn't it? That's saying we live in, in, a, we live in a kind of world that most of our contemporaries in our world is blind to. But if we could just wake up, we would see that in, in one crucifixion among the thousands that the Romans did outside the walls of Jerusalem, thousands of crucified Jews, this was a common daily experience outside the walls of Jerusalem. But the early Christians said this one, this one crucifixion, there was something taking place that nobody had eyes to see. And so the New Testament authors proclaim with this prophetic voice that there was some the reconciliation of heaven and earth was happening in this crucifixion and in fact this death brings life but to experience this life you have to die too that's poetic you know what I'm saying and that's just not poetic and trying to be clever and obscure that's actually what has to happen because our sin breeds that and for us to have any kind of life we have to join we have to join Jesus on the cross. The, the cross is the ultimate symbol of prophetic poetry. It's the ultimate everyday symbol from 2,000 years ago that became put into a whole new, combined into a whole new context that now disrupts the listener and says, you and I deserve to be up there. But in fact, this, he took it for us so that we can have shalom. The son of God loved me and gave himself for me. This is the ultimate act of pro prophetic prophetic poetry. And that's what we gather around every single week. Amen? Amen. It seems to me this, this act, this symbol, is something that can be the source of endless inspiration for us on, as teams, as individuals in our work in the church and in the world, in the world at large. What this means to you, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea, right? But I trust that the, the Spirit can use, can, can use what's inside of you and your unique story and your unique life experiences to draw together the, me, the medium, the raw materials of your life into an expression of prophetic poetry to the people that you, uh, that you influence. And uh, may this whole day be aimed uh, at equipping you and encouraging you towards that towards that end. Let me close in word of prayer. Jesus, we, uh, we confess our lack of perception. Uh, we confess our, our lack of ability to see the profound beauty, the reality of, of your presence and your goodness displayed uh, in the world and in our own lives. Lord, we confess even our own lack of ability to see the sin and the brokenness that's in our own lives, in our neighborhoods, in our churches. Lord, we are people who are dependent on you to, to hear a word from you that gives life and that exposes and says what is true about us. And so Jesus, would you... Uh, would you uh, just renew our hearts, renew our perception, give us new eyes to see our own lives? Uh, would, you, would you make us prophets uh, who disrupt in a way uh, that steers people towards you and brings life? We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen? Yeah, amen.